So a couple years ago, I moved up to New York for my undergrad, and when I first got there, I didn't really have any friends, I didn't have anybody to hang out with, and so I thought, okay, I need to fill this time with something. And something that I had always wanted to get into was poker. Um, so I just kind of sat in my room, I looked up the rules, and I started playing online. Um, and I liked poker. It, I thought it was fun, it's a lot of probability, but admittedly, something that I found even more fascinating was just the chip shuffling that poker players would do. As poker players are sitting there waiting for their next move, they'll often take a stack of chips, split it in half, and then do this. They'll pick it up and interlace all the chips, and then push it together and do it again. And they'll keep doing this. Now, often poker players are just doing this with one color of chips, so you can't trace the movement of any one given chip, but if we sub out one of these stacks for one of a different color, we can actually begin to pay attention to that. And what we'll notice is they start off separated, one of this color and one blue, and we'll do one shift, two shifts, three shifts, four, and then notice that after the fifth shift, we're back to them being separated again. And this kind of opens up a really obvious question. After how many shifts will they re-separate? And uh, I thought this would probably be a really simple question to answer. Um, for instance, this one took five shifts, and guess what? Each of these stacks has five chips in it. I thought that's probably the rule. Uh, so I tried it with uh, some other amounts. I tried it with three. Three and three. We go one, two, Three. Oh, sure enough, they are separated again. I tried it with four. One, two, three. It only took three shifts. And this is really strange, right? Why would three and four have the same number of shifts? Um, it must not be that the rule is it takes n shifts to get them separated again, where n is the number of chips in one of these stacks. So if that's not the rule, then what is the rule? So I asked myself this question a couple weeks ago, and um, it was right in the middle of finals week. I didn't have a lot of time to explore it. Um, so I just kind of had to put it to the side. But I figured it probably wasn't something too complicated. I just hadn't worked it out yet. So on my first day off, I started sketching up some diagrams, trying to work out where each chip was moving to, and I couldn't come up with any workable theory that well predicted how many shifts it would take. So I hopped on Python and I started coding simulations of these shifts, and now I had a calculator that could just tell me, given some amount of chips in a stack, how many shifts will it take before they re-separate. And then I returned to that first hypothesis when we started shifting them where it seemed like the number of chips was what determined how many shifts it would take for the chips to separate themselves. I wanted to know for which numbers of chips was that actually the case. And it turns out there's very specific ones where it's the case. I'll show some of them on screen now. These are the only numbers where this happens. There's infinitely many of them, but they seem random. They don't seem to follow a pattern, at least nothing super discernible. After not being able to come up with any pattern for these numbers, I went to the online encyclopedia of integer sequences, and I plugged in the series of numbers where the number of chips equals the number of shuffles needed to separate them out again. And what I found was that this sequence of numbers was already known about, something called canoe numbers. <laughs> I'm grossly mispronouncing that. It's a French word, and my French isn't great, but it roughly sounds like canoe. Canoe? So this leads to an obvious question. Why is there an overlap between canoe numbers and cases where the number of chips equals the number of shifts required to re-separate the chips? Now, to be honest, I had to do some digging to find the connection. I had to go through several papers going over the canoe numbers, but eventually I did come up with an intuition for why this is. Now, I don't wanna get into the super nitty gritty of all of this, but I'm just gonna kinda of outline why this is so that maybe we come away feeling like we have a gut sense for why this is true. 
So here's how we're gonna do this. I'm gonna take two stacks of four chips and I'm gonna number them like this. Next, I'm only going to pay attention to what numbers this top chip has hit. So it starts off in position one. Notice that there's two ones, but we're not gonna differentiate between them. We're just gonna say it's in position one. After one shift, notice that it is now in position two. After another shift, it's now in position four. And after one more shift, it's back to position one. So let's keep track of the numbers that this chip encountered. It encountered one, then two, then four, and then one again, so we don't need to count it twice. It only encountered one, two, and four. It missed three. So now let's try this with five chips. Remember, five is the number that we started out with, and we saw that it took five shifts to separate the chips out again. So let's try this. It starts off in position one, and then after one shift, it's in position two. After another shift, it's in position four. And after another shift, it's in position three. After another shift, it's in position five. And after one more shift, it's back in position one. Keeping track of those numbers, it went one, two, four, three, five it encountered each number along the way. This is at the core of the canoe numbers and poker shuffling, because what we can say is that position one always goes to two, two always goes to four, four always goes to three, and three always goes to five. This is, of course, assuming that we have five chips. Remember that with four chips, we didn't encounter every number. We only encountered three numbers. And remember that four took three shuffles to get back around. What we're touching on is the reason why it takes a certain number of shifts to separate the chips out. It has to do with whether or not a chip is getting back to its starting position. And there are certain numbers of chips where if you trace the motion of a single chip, it'll encounter every single number in the sequence. And if there's five numbers in the sequence, it'll take five shifts to get back to where it started. This is what the French mathematician Canoe was interested in. So let's take a look at his problem and see if we can make the connection. What he was thinking about was if we have a string of some amount of numbers, say five, and we arrange them as follows. We'll take the biggest number and put it at the beginning, the smallest number and put it after that, the second biggest number after that, the second smallest number after that, and so on. He wanted to know when can you write this movement in a kind of cyclic way? So what do I mean by cyclic? Well, notice that we could describe the change from our original string, one, two, three, four, five, to the second string, five, one, four, two, three, as follows. We could say one went to position two, two went to position four, four went to position three, three went to position five, and five went to position one. So we've cycled back to one just by describing the motion of each position. So let's see what happens if we only have four elements in our string. Well, we'll go from one, two, three, four to four, one, three, two. So now let's try writing this in the same way that we wrote five. Uh, one went to position two, two went to position four, four went to position one, but now we've gotten back to one and we never had to mention three. And in fact, three went to position three. Three never changed. We can't write four in the same way. It doesn't encounter every number, which is exactly what we encountered when we were discussing the chips. With four chips, a given chip doesn't make it to every single position. It skips three. So hopefully now we're seeing the connection. The canoe numbers directly correlate to the cases where it takes n shuffles to re-separate the chips out again. Another way to think about this is where it takes n shifts for every chip to get back to where it started. And finally, I want to mention one of the coolest parts of this, that prime numbers come into the canoe numbers. It turns out that every single canoe number times two plus one is a prime. And what this means is that we can actually test prime numbers by shuffling poker chips. So here's how we'll test it. 
we can take five yellow chips and five blue chips. And we'll begin shuffling them. And remember that it takes five chip shuffles to get it back around to being separated. What this verifies is that five is a canoe number, which means that two times five plus one will be a prime number. And sure enough, that's 11, which we know to be prime. Now, you can't use this to show that a number is not prime, but anytime you do have a canoe number, you can show that a number is prime. So let's try it out with a couple more. Uh, we had five and five, let's make it six and six. We'll shuffle them once, twice, three times, four times, five times, and finally, six times. And notice that they are separated. Because we have six chips in a stack, this verifies that six is also a canoe number, which means that two times six plus one must be a prime number, and sure enough, we get 13. What I really love about this is that it shows how so many different areas of mathematics can be interconnected. Eddie Wu has a video that I really like where he talks about thinking deeply about simple things. And I think this is a perfect example of that. This didn't seem like a very complicated thing to start off, but in thinking deeply, we made a connection that at first seemed like it would never exist. So to quote Eddie Wu, who I believe quoted someone else, think deeply about simple things.